welcome back to The Writing Retreat. I am your host, speculative fiction writer Lindy Jung, and I am so excited to introduce our first ever guest today, Kelly Tai. So for those of you who don't already know her, Kelly is an amazing person. Um, she is a very, very accomplished editor and writer, as well as a fellow author tuber. Some of her credentials include working as an editor on Autoker Magazine, running her own freelance editorial business, Bramble and Crow Books, and also publishing poetry and prose across a wide range of publications, including Martian Magazine and Solar Punk Magazine. Is there anything I missed? No, that was amazing. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, thank you so much for coming on. Sorry we had to do that intro twice. <laughs> um, yeah, Joe, so I'm just going to try to keep a sort of on task, but also if it you know slips into a conversation or a sidetrack, that's fine. That's the nature of this podcast. Um, it's a cozy and casual virtual writing retreat with all your friends, which today is me and Kelly. So let's go ahead and get started with the first segment, if that's okay. Yeah, okay, let's go. Great. So the first segment is basically just what we're reading and writing lately. So you can go. Yes, yes. I was going to grab my books, oh, oh, but I didn't. <laughs> so um, I'm actually reading two books right now. Um, the first one is called, I believe, The History of Medieval Times, mm -hmm. something like that. Just because I'm currently working on a YA fantasy. And although I, I believe... <laughs> I mean, it's a fantasy world, so I can do whatever I want, but I want it to have like a more grounding within medieval times. Um, so I'm just reading the book to get kind of more information on what it was like to live um, during that era. Um, because I was looking up like horses, like if you bring a horse into a town, where do you leave your horse? Mm -hmm. And anyway, just like silly, silly details like that. So I'm reading that book and I'm also reading, um, it's called... What is it called? Dance of Thieves by Mary E. Pearson. Yeah, yeah I, that one is a spinoff to probably like a series you've heard of, um, The Remnant Chronicles. The first book is called Kiss of Deception. Mm -hmm. Oh, I didn't know yeah. that was a spinoff, but I've heard good things mm -hmm. about it. I might even have the, that one on ebook or something. Yeah, yeah, I heard good things about it too. I did enjoy the original series, um, but because I am writing a YA fantasy too, I was like, I, I like to read in the genre I'm writing in, mm -hmm. so gotta do my gotta do my research. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that makes total sense. Yeah, but I'm really excited to start reading. I mean, I just started, like, mm -hmm. I'm on chapter two. Yeah, no, let me know what you think of that. I feel like I haven't touched mm -hmm. a young adult fantasy in a really long time, but there is good stuff out there. It's just, mm -hmm. I've been reading, like, most of my YA fantasy consumption has been arcs, mm -hmm. and there's just, there's something about it. I think the quality leaves a little bit to be desired. Yeah, I just feel like why fantasy kind of feels like it's very dynamic, like it changes really fast. Mm. Um, so a lot of why fantasy I feel like is leaning towards like almost romanticy. So I'm kind yes. of looking for just like a pure YA fantasy, <laughs> which I think is what I'm trying to write. Um, but yeah, like I'm excited to go back into a YA fantasy. I haven't read one in a while, mm -hmm. so it'll be exciting. Sorry, I think my audio quality may have just changed because I switched to my microphone, but it's totally fine. <laughs> it's okay. So much disaster. Should we start over? No, no, no. It's, to it's over? totally oh, okay. okay. I don't really care. Um, yeah, no, that's great. I love that you are reading in your genre and like trying to read current stuff because I think that is very important. And the first person I heard this from was you, and I mentioned it in my last podcast episode, but like that vocal mm -hmm. training that Arif Kwong talks about is oh, really yeah, important. Yeah, I remember. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, and I think, I do think that young adult fantasy sometimes becomes like an echo chamber almost in terms of mm -hmm. what tropes are popular and what, you know, yeah. settings and whatever are popular, but it's, it's good to to read in your genre. And I like, I like that you're reading nonfiction too. Like I find that really admirable. <laughs> yeah yeah thanks i i really enjoy reading nonfiction. i want to read more um but sometimes i feel like i'm trying to like take notes and try to remember it feels like school yeah. it does feel like school yeah. yeah yeah i have a hard time like actually retaining information without taking notes so mm -hmm. i have to fight the Me urge too. to take notes and then it just makes the reading process really long which is more yeah, i lean toward yeah. narrative nonfiction. but 
I, mm-hmm. I have been really enjoying the book that I mentioned last time because I'm just filming yeah, this the next day. One? Yeah, it's been really nice. Other than that, last night I also finished reading Time is a Mother by Ocean Vuong. I don't know that one, but I've read his his poems. Yeah, I loved On Earth Were Briefly Gorgeous, which was, I believe, his mm-hmm. first prose. It was his first like novel, but it was very like... It felt like if a poem were a novel, basically, because it's very flow of consciousness and like going from one idea to the next, but it tied together really wonderfully. And yeah, I loved Mm -hmm. reading. I mean, not loved because it was so tragic and it made me cry, but reading about like his family history and his history was really powerful. Yeah, it's the first poetry book I've read maybe in years. Time is a mother, I mean. And Mm -hmm. I was like, I really struggle to engage with poetry. This is definitely a me thing. I just don't like poetry the same way I like prose Mm -hmm. which is it sounds awful but I really liked and the last one kind of like made me tear up I was I was emotional over a poem which has never happened before (laughs) but it was yeah it was a really good one and it was a really quick read as well although maybe I Mm -hmm. should have taken it more slowly so I could absorb it yeah I haven't read that collection but I definitely think that poetry is it's different from prose, um, and I think, I, I don't know, I can't explain it. I think for poetry, it's all about, like, feelings, Yeah. so it's not really about, like, how you really interpret it, it's just how, how does it make you feel, and I'm I'm glad it, like, you know, like, I don't know, okay, I'm not glad you cried, because that's, like, not great, but... No, no, it was good. really It was really wonderfully written, so... Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I have his, um, I think, Night Sky and Exit Wounds, I have that one, mm-hmm. and the way he depicted or wrote about you know his family as you mentioned like i was thinking to myself i'm like i have like first world problems (laughs) based on like what his family has gone through and like Mm -hmm. what a lot of people have gone through and to an extent are still going through in different parts of the world yeah so yeah that was it was was a good yeah yeah no he's really good Mm -hmm. and he captures that so well and that was another like I am not kidding. What you just said about poetry is more about capturing the emotion. Mm-hmm. That was a thought I had while reading it. I was like, oh my god, because yeah. this all this does is capture the emotion and like makes you feel it through the page, and that's mm-hmm. so powerful. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. almost to an extent, I want to see more like literature that does that because I think in literature and also in poetry analysis, like we just focus so much on like picking apart the themes and like what did the mm-hmm. writer mean by this, 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 and I'm like. What if the writer is just trying to put an emotion on the page and make you feel it? And it's not so much yeah. about like themes and morality and lessons, but just like mm-hmm. feeling, like a pure tidal wave of feeling. Um, and I I just am like, oh, I want to approach my writing in that way. In some yeah, aspects. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. I'm actually getting goosebumps thinking about that. Oh my gosh, no, it seriously <laughs> Like the is. way you described it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm looking forward to reading your stuff. Oh. I'm going to be feeling oh my gosh, I hope so many so. things. I, things. I consider myself like, emotionally stunted (laughs) i'm just like oh god sorry i mean just because you know i feel like in a lot of east asian culture it's very much like oh keep it together like keep it together Mm -hmm. and i was a kid with a lot of big emotions but i was just told to like keep it together and now i'm weird about feelings and sharing them (laughs) yeah but i i love to i would love to just put more emotion into my work because I do yeah. think you're right in a way. And he had a poem that had a line that mentioned this. Like, it's the typical, mm-hmm. not typical, but I feel like relatively common experience of a white writer approaching him and being like, oh, you're so lucky you get to write about war. And it's like, oh, you can draw on that, like, depth. Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah. And no, I'm like... Oh, I can't believe people actually say that. I think people do think that, um, especially because... Uh, it's, I don't want to say I understand it because it's, like, not an okay thing to say. Like, that's really mm-hmm. fun. That's really bad to say, especially as, like, I'm assuming a white American speaking to someone whose, like, family survived the Vietnam War, yeah. which was yeah. perpetrated by, like, Americans. Um, mm-hmm. But it's it's it comes from a place of, like, oh, if you're able to perform this thing that the general white readership consumption consumer audience enjoys or thinks is like highbrow or you know it's Mm -hmm. almost like voyeurism like white readership a lot of the time especially in those like literary circles I feel like they love to read about you know specifically black and brown but also just pain in general queer pain any pain Mm -hmm. that feels like oh you've been through some kind of struggle and so if you're able to write about that and capitalize on it it's it, I do think that 
it might provide some advantage in terms mm. of getting a claim or like reaching an audience yeah. it, there is an element of yeah. that so i understand where it's coming from but it's not mm-hmm. like uh, with ocean Vuong, he's not it's not performative at all he's really like feeling these things and drawing from his mm. pain in regards to like what his family went through and how it affected him and you can see yeah. he draws a lot of parallels between like his life and his mother's life as a mixed race child mm-hmm. growing up in vietnam and experiencing all that and it's like Whoa, it's so powerful. It, it really is tremendously powerful. Yeah, you put that into words yeah. really well. I I have yet to read like <laughs> his his uh, like his prose, like his novel. Um, but mm-hmm. definitely on my recommend it. Very long. It's TV heavy, art. but yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, here I am yeah. just rambling about a book that you like, haven't read. But no, no, no it's good. I, I love Ocean Wong. Yeah, I do too. I remember he got like flack at one point for talking about metaphor. Or I think he called similes metaphors and people were like being just shitty to him about it. And I'm like, you, he has more talent in his pinky finger than any of y'all <laughs> like nitpickers have yeah. will ever experience. I, 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 didn't, I didn't hear about that one, but it was a while he, ago. he is able to break the rules, I think. Yeah. Even if it's not also, like um, common. It was, mm-hmm. he was giving like advice on how to... Um, draw upon certain types of images and emotions for more powerful metaphors Mm -hmm. and he just like I think either called it a simile or called a simile a metaphor and it was so like the smallest possible thing you could take away from that and I'm just like (laughs) you guys are just freaking jealous yeah (laughs) I that's like really nitpicky it was it was I god ridiculous behavior ridiculous behavior um okay yeah so that's what we're reading sorry did you say what you were writing oh yes Oh no, I didn't. Okay. Wait, did you see what you were reading? Yes, that oh, was what I was reading. <laughs> Just, <laughs> Ocean Vuong. Um, okay, yeah, okay, go yes, ahead yes, and talk yes, about yes. what you're writing. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, I'm currently writing a young adult fantasy. Yeah, I guess I did mention it in passing. Um, yeah, I'm currently in the second draft, so my goal is to make this draft readable mm-hmm. so I can send it to my critique partner and she could have a read through before I said it to you yes. <laughs> maybe to get a read yeah uh just by readable I mean like I want to make sure that there are no plot holes or the ones I, I identify they're fixed and make the lines like somewhat nice it's not just like he danced in the bar in the tavern or something mm. something like that because yeah. I feel like in my first drafts they're very like bare bones they're almost like a fast draft mm-hmm. like a very like just the skeleton so I'm trying to add a lot more add a lot more words to them to yeah. Make it sound like an actual book, like prose. Yeah, like just, I feel that. Like, not just like sentences, yeah. lines, yeah. Yeah, pretty it up and give it an actual like, voice mm-hmm. and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, how far along, like how do you have um, a final goal? Like when do you want to be done by? Um, I'm not sure if I have any like concrete goals, um, but I'm trying, I've been working on the book every day since a few weeks ago, so... I just want to just continuously chip away at it. Hopefully, I can finish it, I guess, by June of next year. I don't know mm. if that's, like, way too far. Like, I'm a little bit struggling to see, like, how much I can push myself. I kind of want to, like... So, I'm currently unemployed right now, so that's just the, mm-hmm. the context to everyone who's new. And I'm trying to decide if I want to, like, really push myself and, like, use this extra time to finish or if I should just kind of chill and like work on it a little bit at a time but yeah anyway the the question was when when am i gonna be done maybe goals uh yeah um, next next june yeah no i feel like that's solid i'll say that for now yeah mm-hmm. oh my gosh that feels it feels far away but it's like objectively not that far away so yeah i think, I think you probably yeah. would probably even like finish before and then yeah, june maybe. is like when you want to query right no i actually i don't know i'm just gonna finish the draft and see what happens yeah but yeah ideally i want to query before the end of next year yeah i feel that i don't know if i'll yeah. get to that point because mods isn't even like a complete draft but i really i do need to put my butt into gear and like finish it so i can query it so i might hit up a cafe after this Ooh, yeah Fun. yeah i realized that okay i don't know i talked about this briefly in like a video but i'm wondering if i actually need to like seek out professional help for like my attention and my focus because like Mm. it's so hard to like for me it's really hard to sit down and just like write Mm. i need like external i don't know like i don't have a problem with 
like work or school i was always able to like finish all my assignments and like take tests fine yeah but for some reason when it comes to my own projects like mm. finding that drive is hard so i'm trying to yeah. just build a discipline by like writing every day yeah that like mm. external motivation is lacking like not getting a grade yeah. and not getting yeah. paid and not yeah. knowing what's on the other side yeah i feel that too it's really hard mm. to justify it especially like when i do need to work to make money and feed myself mm. you know and there's so many other things that take precedence rightfully so because it's mm -hmm. my career and school and yeah. my interpersonal relationships but yeah it is hard to find that time and i think that's why i harp so much on like the joy of writing and not worrying about routines or discipline so much is because like at a, to a certain extent you're not getting paid like no one is giving you money <laughs> yeah. or like yeah. anything really you're not getting compensated so you have to really treat it as a jobby <laughs> like a job hobby but more yeah. emphasis on the hobby yeah but i'm it's sure a balance it is um and yeah let me know if the stuff with attention helps i because i got diagnosed with adhd as an adult like in college mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. i feel like it helped with my schoolwork once i got like medication but I really didn't like the medication. I think also like knowing that that was the issue has helped me circumnavigate it a little bit better. Yeah, it's hard. Um, but I'm, yeah, I'm just trying to like focus on like every day and like just doing a little bit every day. Yeah. But yeah, I think you mentioned that in your last podcast that you just try to write, no, even if it's like 50 words, mm -hmm. like, you still add that to your word count. So yeah, yeah I think it's a habit. Mm -hmm, habits like, like that. Like a cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, except yeah. better going somewhere mm, mm. <laughs> it's debatable <laughs> yeah. a cigarette a day might be more helpful for my mental health oh i'll talk about what i was writing if that's okay oh yeah yeah go ahead and then it's really quick for because i've been writing the same thing always forever until the, the end of the world yeah me um too. i <laughs> no we're gonna finish we're gonna finish in 2024 yeah, it's our so year let's do it it's our year <laughs> But last night I woke up in a haze. I like, couldn't sleep and I wrote like a poem probably because I read like a poem oh, the day nice. before. But it's like, an, it's, I love that it's my first poem and it's about like ants like eating a person. It's, it's like climate rage and I love it. I just feel a lot of climate rage all the time. I think the earth should cook us sometimes <laughs> because we're just so bad to her, but that's yeah. you know, just me being an extremist in that sense. But that's what I've been working on. I'll probably turn it into just like flash fiction because I like poetry. When I write it, I just feel like it's coming from such an inauthentic place <laughs> that there's no way. But I think it's a fun concept. And yeah, I've been really into bugs mm -hmm. a lot, a lot, a lot. I had another short story that was also horror and also bugs. And I just, I love it. Bugs are so, they're so weird. <laughs> um yeah i i thought of this poem idea it wasn't a bug but they were like um maybe they were bugs it was really gross like i didn't take my compost out in time and there started to be like those like gross bugs um oh, yeah and then it was interesting how like even in like such a garbage there's there's life there so yeah that's i didn't write the poem yet but i was thinking about it but yeah mm -hmm. bugs are weird but cool sometimes they're so cool it's <laughs> crazy how there's so many of them like we really are outnumbered by bugs and if they wanted to they could definitely do something about it <laughs> <laughs> if they could organize themselves yeah 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 definitely. but entomology is a really cool field it definitely was not my field at all it was more like um vertebrate zoology but mm -hmm. yeah i mean they've been around since dinosaurs right <laughs> bugs yeah i mean they predate them because the first first like Mm -hmm. organisms really are going to be the ones with the exoskeletons what invertebrates oh my god <laughs> zoology degree like left me for a second no, not first organisms but some of the first like yeah creatures. yeah yeah and the ones that really carved out their ecological niche and mm -hmm. haven't changed that much mm -hmm. since they first evolved it's cool it's cool thinking about something that's like so perfectly formed for this earth and can withstand whatever it throws at it and will absolutely outlive. Like humans are so, I think about this all the time. I'm in Thailand and it's too hot for me. Like mm -hmm. I'm, a lot of the times, yeah. I just feel like I'm gonna <laughs> melt into nothing, but that's not a problem for a bug. The bugs are thriving here, they love it. And this is 
you know, the climate that we're going towards, the just incredible heat. Yeah, I think about that all the time too. Like we're so sensitive to any any change in weather and climate yes. actually. Um, mm -hmm. But speaking of like things that can be really resilient, like I, wait, it's so like a little bit off topic, but oh, I really Lord. like water bears. Um, <gasps> What's their, I can't remember right now. Uh, tardigrades. tardigrades. Yeah, yeah. I did a little mini project on them. Oh so I got to like God. collect moss and look for them in Costa Rica. Oh, was, they're so cute. That's awesome. Yeah. Oh my God. I'm so jealous of your trip. <laughs> <laughs> but um, in in Shoreline of Infinity, um, the one of the magazines I just recently have a piece in, there was a poem in there specifically about tardigrades. And I was that's like, beautiful. I love this. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. that's amazing. I, they deserve more poetry written about them. They're yeah. so, like, they're little, like, movements. I'm usually kind of squicked out by, like, microscopic creatures, but they're just so, like, they have little <laughs> feet, and they're just, like, yeah. kind of chubby. They're super <laughs> cute. They're super cute. Yeah. And they're really incredible creatures. It actually, like, sometimes I'm like, I can't believe I can't actually see that because it's so small. Yeah. It's hard for me as, like, a squishy type ecology type scientist to, like, think of microscopic creatures existing it kind of freaks me out sometimes all right do you want to yeah okay i have a very precarious balance going on here <laughs> so scared to mess it up um but yeah let's go on to the next little segment i just wanted to like do a mini interview segment basically sure like three questions okay so yeah because we have you on here we're going to use your expertise and okay ready let's do it all right so my first question is, are there any pertinent writing lessons that you've learned from working as an editor, both freelance and with Augur? Like, what would you say your biggest takeaways have been from that experience as an editor that you've pulled into your writing? Mm -hmm. Wow, this is a very good question. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think I've learned a, a ton, actually, but specifically, like, to my writing. Um, mm -hmm. I think... The first, well, for short fiction, I guess I'll talk about that from Augur's perspective. So um, I was doing slush reading. So this means that mm -hmm. you don't know uh, what you're getting and you're just reading what's on the page um, yeah. without understanding like, oh, what's the background? Something that you would get a query letter. Like when you read a book, you get the back of the cover. But when you're slush mm -hmm. reading, you don't get anything. And so um, definitely what I've learned from that is the first few pages really shape your reader's understanding of the context in the world so mm. definitely grounding your readers is very very important i definitely did not do a lot of grounding before so remember how we were talking about like feeling like writing about feelings so yeah. i think when i was a newer writer all i did was like info it's like not info dump emotions but info dump feeling and it's just like uh who's like and then like when someone would read it i would get comments like oh i'm not really sure like who is this person? Like, what's going on? Mm. Like, where in, like, the physical world are we in? So I think in terms of uh, short fiction, um, definitely grounding your characters, especially in the secondary world. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I would say that for Augur. And for my, like, freelance editing, so I mostly do, um, I would say speculative fiction. And I think, well, not, this is not necessarily for writing, my, my own writing, but I definitely try to read a lot more um mm -hmm. now that i've seen an array of different manuscripts i think it's a little bit obvious um when someone hasn't stayed as current in the current like in the market or in their yeah. storytelling because yeah or even um not just like the prose itself um but you can almost see that in the writing um like technical writing like the grammar and the dialogue and the conversations that could be a little bit stilted so mm -hmm. now that i've seen some manuscripts like that i do think it's really important to just keep reading so you understand mm -hmm. like intuitively you know when to uh like have a paragraph break or how to format dialogue so maybe um like i realized that i actually didn't format dialogue correctly for a bit um, mm -hmm. yeah, so, like, Wait. sorry, how do you format dialogue? And I'm, I'm, like, paranoid now that I'm <laughs> oh, not no, formatting okay. it correctly. <laughs> yeah, no, I didn't realize, like, um, so I think the pitfall I had was, like, if there's a quote, like, but it's a question mark, but then you do, like, they ask 
or she asks so that she would be not capitalized oh uh, okay yeah, yeah 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 but i was like capitalizing that for some reason i didn't it like it's confusing because yeah. it's an ending uh, punctuation mark yeah it's an ending it's at the end of the statement because if it's a period you would capital yeah no, yeah. yeah 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 if it's yeah, period, yeah, yeah. so it's like yeah it's like really confusing so <laughs> yeah but that's something i learned like i um because like when we read books we take all that for granted yeah but yeah Anyway, did that answer your question? Like, yeah, no, okay, that's okay, okay. good. It's like the things that you start to pick up mm-hmm. on that are your own weaknesses but are reflected in other mm-hmm. people. And yeah, you, yeah, okay. no, that makes total sense. That's one of the reasons that I want to like go into more editorial stuff. I actually <laughs> applied to read for Slush for a magazine oh, um, nice. this month, like last month, and we'll see if they want me. But oh, I think it would will. be really, it would be really fun, and I want to like help out and get more involved with um, mm-hmm. the short fiction market scene yeah. because it's so it's the last bastion of literature at this point <laughs> yeah slush so reading like once you do it you can't unsee almost like um yeah your own ra- yeah, yeah 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 That's i think great. it just kind of like primes your brain to be aware of it and mm-hmm. i've mm-hmm. been beta reading a lot less like i used to beta read a lot so much that it was actually really overwhelming Mm -hmm. and i've cut back on that a lot a lot because i'm just not on social media anymore and i don't like i feel like i've pared down my writing friendships (laughs) Mm -hmm. a lot like i would say you guys are my close friends and then i have Mm -hmm. some people from twitter that we moved to discord and i talk to them relatively regularly um but yeah like i don't have that big social circle that i used to for sure so which is kind of nice because i feel like it would just be constant beta reading. Um, yeah. But yeah, I do want to like read more. And I think it's more feasible for me to like read a lot of short fiction as opposed to a lot of novels. Mm-hmm. Exciting. Yeah, definitely beta reading a lot of manuscripts. That's also a lot of like, I think pressure on, on you as a beta reader to give it is. feedback. Yeah, I don't know. I feel like yeah. I, w- I like I tr- like I only have a handful of like writer friends. and I trust you guys so much. I can't imagine like. <laughs> having someone yeah. I don't really know that well to read, but, but everyone's I like to have, mm-hmm. I like to have people I don't know really well read. And that's oh, okay. the other thing is like, I like to have a big pool. So I would try to reciprocate for as many people as yeah, possible, yeah. which I'm going to do a lot less of, especially mm-hmm. with mods. But yeah, it's like at a certain point, there's only so much I could do to help. And I think when I was newer mm-hmm. or like, fresher on the scene and not as experienced with giving critique I wasn't I wasn't like delivering my critique in a way that made sense like I was trying to um convey my thoughts on what an issue was and maybe it wasn't being received well and then Mm -hmm. the communication is just endless like you know it just goes back and forth for so long um and now I'm just better at kind of like being like here's my piece take it or leave it yeah, I remember you I made like a video on how to give critiques. I really like that video. Oh, thank you. Yeah. yeah, I think it is an art, and I don't think I'm the best at it, which is why I don't offer like full <laughs> editorial packages. I just do it on my Patreon mm-hmm. for like a couple bucks. Um, but actually, just if I could quickly <laughs> say something, if I do think that if anyone is like looking to hire an editor, I would say like try to do as much of a self-edit as you can, like take it as far as you can as possible. Because if you're doing like a developmental edit and you're not formatting your dialogue correctly, um, your editor might actually not know who's speaking. And if they don't know who's speaking, they cannot, they would not be able to articulate like their arcs even because the the clarity on the page is is just not there or it's confusing. So in general, um, I would just advise to take it as far as possible um and then and then your editor can pick up from there high key agree and second Mm -hmm. that i understand the urge to like get another set of eyes on your work but at the same time um you really have to be conscious of like people's time and energy Mm -hmm. and if your work isn't like at a baseline you know taken as far as you can take it as you said i think that's a really good way of putting it Like, you're not ready for an editor. And Mm -hmm. think about, like, what you're spending your money on. You want someone who can help you with stuff that you couldn't already figure out on your own. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, versus, like, Mm -hmm. just throwing it at an editor and expecting them to Mm -hmm. clean up the whole thing from you from start to finish. Yeah. Um, Yeah, so it's not really fair. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I don't think it's fair on the author either because 
you're not you i don't think you would get as much of a comprehensive edit if you're able to fix up like those like dialogue yeah because then your editor could talk about the character arc and things like that yeah yeah your editor is going to get distracted by like the really simple mistakes and that's Mm going to be frustrating for you too because an editor is an expensive thing and it's like a specialty um role you know Mm -hmm. so you want to treat it as such and not like a general yeah i think people kind of misunderstand the point of like hiring an editor especially for self-published books like it's it's a very specific part of the process that's a very specific part of like the timeline that you're getting to but yeah thanks for bringing that up all right so my next question which is going to be a segue into our topic of the day which i'm so excited for is so little primers that you write quite a bit of science fiction which i think Mm -hmm. is incredible um So my questions are, what draws you to science fiction, particularly your interest in space? And also, Mm -hmm. what's your personal history with science as a subject? Again, particularly with like space and not Mm -hmm. just the genre, but the actual study of, I guess, astronomy or the Mm -hmm. space itself. I don't know. Yeah, no, these are good questions. Thanks for like, yeah, I do write a lot about space. Um, (laughs) Uh, okay, sorry. I'm gonna try to remember the questions. Uh, so, yeah, no worries. why why do I feel drawn to this subject? Right, the first one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, honestly, I think it might be tied closely to the second. So, my history of like space as science, I actually don't have any at no, all. Yeah, and but I think what I initially like what initially drew me to science fiction was a lot of movies I watched as a kid. Mm. Mm -hmm. um so i definitely like thank my dad for that so like yeah i grew up watching like star wars and Mm. then there was all those like alien movies like independence day like aliens yeah Um, Yeah. also starship trooper which my brother really (laughs) loved (laughs) i think it's about these like alien bugs and people are fighting these alien bugs Mm -hmm. and um i used to watch a ton of power rangers and there's definitely like space power rangers and yeah yeah so i think that i don't know like I just think that science fiction or like maybe space just seems a bit more closer to I think now in the present so it's easier for me to sort of relate to it almost like I feel like with a fantasy setting sometimes I feel like it's too far from Mm. my current world Um, but with science fiction um, I feel like it's it could happen like maybe it could happen yeah Um, yeah so I really like the idea i mean i do think that i mean it's okay it's impossible i think it's impossible for us to be like the only like living sentient creatures like it is (laughs) in the universe like uh yeah like space is so big um Mm -hmm. and to think i don't know i'm just like really interested in in that like life in general (laughs) um or like ecosystems so mm-hmm. I don't have any, like, science background. I did take AP Bio in high school, but I <laughs> didn't do that well. Um, but I do have, um, I, went to, I went to school in computer science. So um, I do think that the idea of, like, technology is very interesting, too. Yeah. Um, and combine that with my intrigue of space, I guess. I feel like there's a lot of potential for, for stories. So mostly, yeah. I don't know. I guess it's just like a a feeling that I'm that I like to pursue in. I like to dabble in. Yeah. No, that's mm-hmm. awesome. And I was curious about like your personal relationship because um, with the subject of science and also with like a strong. I keep almost saying astrology. So if I say yeah. astrology, I swear I know the difference. I just can't talk sometimes. But astronomy, because I've been thinking a lot as someone who. I haven't written much science fiction at all, but I do have like a degree in in science. I talk about it Mm -hmm. all the time because I love it. I love science. I want to teach science. Like it is such a huge part of that side of my life, but it's hard for me to translate like what I know about science into like science fiction. And I've Mm -hmm. been just like thinking about that a lot, which is kind of going to be our topic of the day, but Mm -hmm. yes, great answer. And I'm so excited to dive into this with you because I think our perspectives is like a science fiction person and a science person is like yeah, gonna be so yeah. fun um yeah. and it's not like a debate or anything it's just like talking about science fiction mm-hmm. and what is the deal mm-hmm. with it and that is the topic of the day is what's the deal with science fiction books so there's a couple points i made here we can kind of start wherever i did sort of write them in order but they're not super organized 
I am really interested in talking about like why you think science fiction isn't as like it's not perceived as selling as well as fantasy at least yeah. lately and I yeah. think in the sense that the amount of science fiction like new science fiction that publishers are picking up is really slim compared to fantasy especially in like the big market age mm -hmm. categories like young adult um, mm -hmm. but I do think that's sort of a false narrative because the Hunger Games is technically science fiction, but it's like a very different yeah. kind. Yeah, I actually was just watching. So Alexa Dunn did a video. I think it, I mean it was about three or four years ago um, on mm. why why a sci-fi doesn't sell that well. And apparently, mm. in that video, she mentioned that publishers don't view dystopian as science fiction for some That's reason. That's what I thought, which is really but weird because what else would it be? <laughs> yeah, it doesn't have know. its own. Um, I think the thing is that dystopian is science fiction used as like a backdrop and it's also like usually a lot closer to where we are at. So in the timeline of like mm -hmm. humanity, it's a little bit closer than like Star Wars. Um, yeah. But although some might argue that Star Wars is like back because it's a long time ago <laughs> in a galaxy far, far away. But with science fiction, or with dystopian and with the Hunger Games specifically, it's like social science fiction. But mm, I see. Sorry, I'm gonna like go into a whole thing, and I don't know how eloquent I'll be. But no, the social side of science is just as critical to science as the science itself. Mm -hmm. In the practice, like in the actual discipline of science, like scientific industry and study, and also within science fiction or fiction that explores science, whatever you want to call it, it's just as critical. Yeah. Um, just because they're not actively, you know, talking about physics. <laughs> Mm -hmm. on the page doesn't make it any less science fiction yeah i and i don't like or i don't agree that science fiction is only narrowed to like space mm -hmm. or like time jumping in time mm -hmm. or anything like that i do think if it's in now but like in the future if it's like post-apocalyptic i can still like i think that's still science fiction it is. Um, especially if there's a big component of like technology in it mm -hmm. um but yeah, yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't know why it's not. But anyway, yeah. um, so I, I remember like there was that peak in publishing where they were like releasing a ton of like sci-fi, this like dystopian. Oh yeah, Diversion was also falling up after yeah, Hunger yeah. Games. Um, there was like that one space, I think it's called Across the Sky, Across the Universe. Oh, Across the Universe. I think like Beth Revis. Yeah, it was like it's like a very old book. I mean, not old, mm -hmm. but like maybe two thousand nine, two thousand ten. Yeah, yeah, like back yeah. then, like wave. Yeah, yeah, and I feel like I don't know. I feel like publishing thinks no one wants to read it, but how can anyone like how can they get new people to read it if they're not publishing new sci-fi and we're only reading yeah. <laughs> science fiction from? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, no, exactly. And I think science mm -hmm. fiction more so than fantasy has this thing where I don't know if this is just the few books that I've seen that are coming out or have come out recently, but mm -hmm. they'll comp the like um, what I consider like the big three, which is like Star Wars, Star Trek or Asimov. And yeah. if it is to be considered science fiction, it has to like fall into one of those slots, basically. And I don't I don't know of a lot of other genres mainstream like genres that really do that and don't allow room for growth which is really weird yeah. because like those are all kind of old I, I, mm -hmm. there's just this weird kind feedback loop yeah, yeah where it's like science fiction is constantly like parasitizing itself or like cannibalizing mm -hmm. itself it's drawing yeah, on yeah. its traditions and like what science fiction looks like in the like general mm -hmm. public's mind mm -hmm. versus what science fiction was back in the day of Asimov where he was like, oh, yeah. this is like a weird concept. I'm gonna explore it in fiction and like play around with it. And it was, he was learning, I think, or taking more directly from, I think the science of the time versus drawing on like Star Wars, obviously it didn't exist <laughs> yeah. yet. I think there is sort of like um, a communication gap between science and mm -hmm. science fiction writers right now. and. I don't think that's like a bad thing and I wouldn't be like oh you can't be a science fiction writer if you're not up to date mm -hmm. on like science now magazine and mm -hmm. reading all the newest 
yeah. vaccine technology things <laughs> like are a trained virologist <laughs> i think it's it's sort of interesting that thing i've noticed as someone from the yeah. science side of things yeah i wonder like actually i don't know the stats of how many people go into like science fields but i'm thinking that the people like let's say it's a small percent and let's say like there is even a smaller percent of people writing so maybe it's just not a popular i don't know like i don't yeah. know, like i i do like science like i um try to watch as many like up-to-date youtube videos as i can mm -hmm. um so i don't know if a part of it is like the writers are also interested in science and maybe there aren't as many as, as i say fantasy yeah and i wonder if like there's a pressure to get the science correct mm. and the intimidation yeah. of that i think science has also become a lot less fun on the subject side of things mm -hmm. and i think i obviously was not alive in the time of asimov but it's less exciting to like hear news like we're not people aren't like looking for science news in the same way there's less of like mm -hmm. a general public yeah. hunger for the latest mm -hmm. updates on science people at this point don't even want to understand <laughs> yeah. um the basics so yeah and i think yeah, as a, um, an educator what i will notice is that if a student feels like science is difficult which it is a difficult subject to study mm -hmm. they're gonna shut it off completely and like not engage mm -hmm. with it for the rest of their life which is something i'm really trying to circumvent because i think that's very yeah. bad um science literacy is on like a decline i think there are statistics to show that at least mm -hmm. in the west and that might contribute to it the yeah yeah, yeah the lack of not that there's not breakthroughs being made but like the major breakthroughs you know like people mm -hmm. are we're not landing folks on the moon anymore and we, <laughs> or if we are it's like old yeah news, that's you true, know? true yeah 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 i never consider that but yeah that's a good point i was also wondering if people in general are like scared of space because mm. it's so big and unknown i'm scared of space <laughs> <laughs> but i can like watch media about it because that's not real space i'm scared of real space like black holes and shit Oh. yeah yeah oh my god i watched this um movie it's called sunshine i highly um, recommend it It has a a huge cast uh like a-list stars but this movie was filmed a while ago like michelle yo is on it yeah uh, i've heard really exactly. good things about that movie yeah and chris evans and oh, a bunch of people wow. killian murphy's in it <laughs> oh my god yes okay gotta yeah. watch it <laughs> yeah it's a very um yeah it's 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 a space movie but it's pretty interesting it gets a bit a bit philosophical at the end but i like that yeah. i think science is a very philosophical thing that's why mm -hmm. as as much as he, he has his faults i really like nolan's movies because i think he genuinely adores science and even if he's not mm -hmm. always like 100 percent on it he's willing to like try new things and that's the other thing is like science fiction is thriving in cinema yeah like tv yeah. and movies so why is it not translating into like readership yeah actually yes. i was just literally thinking about this like this morning i feel like most i don't know if it's true but i feel like most sci-fi movies i watch have like a male protagonist and i'm not sure <laughs> sci-fi <laughs> gender gap yeah Sorry. yeah yeah the gender gap so I don't know. For some reason, I feel like reading is so dominated by women. I don't know if it's because I'm just on book talk and I'm like on YouTube and I see mostly women talking about books. Um, so maybe I don't know. I mean, I I think the characters I read are mostly women just because I don't know they're more more popular. So I wonder mm -hmm. if there's just like a, like the gap that you mentioned that most I don't know if it's true if most male authors write male characters or most female writers write female characters, but. I yeah, mean, I'm writing, I think, a current, I'm writing a yeah. male character right now, so... <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I think you know what I'm saying. But yeah, no, there's definitely more men in science fiction. And there's more men mm. in, like, science fields still for mm -hmm, most of them. Mm -hmm. It's still very male. It's like a man's world. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, 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 yeah, and Hollywood is still, like, it barely has female directors and female writers still. So there's very much... It's still very much a male-dominated industry. Yeah. And um, I, that's probably part of it i i don't know how i can't quite figure out the correlation or the connection mm -hmm. but there's something there there's something with that like yeah gender gap. yeah definitely I'm and maybe sure it either. is because a lot of people i know who love sci-fi like their dads introduced them to it or they watched it with their brother 
Yeah. I feel like it's such a guy thing to be like into Star Wars, into Star Trek. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And also this is very like gender binary, obviously, you know, mm-hmm. gender spectrum, but just speaking in the most general terms for simplicity's yeah, yeah. sake. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know what it is. Like why, what? <laughs> why is it so male still? Yeah. Yeah. But hopefully that will start changing. Um, yeah. I recently read this book. Oh, I forgot what it's called. Uh, but it's by Kritika Rao. Um, it was like a, well, it was like a science fantasy, but I thought it was leaning towards sci-fi where people live in these like lands in space. Um, people can like manipulate plants. Ooh. So yeah. yeah, it was like a BIPOC women author. So nice. I feel Wait, like. Can you send me that letter? That sounds like something I'd really like. Yeah, I will. I will. It was, yeah, it was so cool. <laughs> Yeah, it gets really abstract at some points, but mm. um, yeah, definitely good no, to read. I like yeah, that. To you. yeah, I am also. I think science fantasy will probably be the next. I don't know. It'll yeah. be the the link, and then it'll hopefully get more people into science fiction. Yeah, yeah, I but, think so too. Yeah, but people have to write it first, and it has to take off first. Because <laughs> I think people are getting kind of sick of fantasy. I think at least the tried and true, the mm. you know, fey fantasy dragons to an extent are people are getting a little bit sick of them um it's it's just like i feel like we're just constantly regurgitating the same concepts in fantasy at this point Uh, at least in like the young adult market because that is a market that will do that that's just how it's Mm -hmm. designed and i think maybe science fantasy will be the next why i think or we'll go back into dystopian because of the hunger games (laughs) which would be really interesting yeah i have to read the prequel i got on my kindle i haven't read it yet mm. but i haven't I'm read forward it, to it either i i might i the movie was not very good in my oh, opinion yeah, i just like... didn't i didn't enjoy it that much or i i had a good time actually that's the weird thing is i was like i think objectively this is kind of the main thing was the pacing was just really weird like i thought mm-hmm. the movie was over three separate times but um <laughs> But as I was watching it, I like couldn't stop laughing at myself because I was like, the President Snow is so hot in this. And I was like, <laughs> I'm not seeing the gates of heaven. Everyone on like all the social medias or whatever are, are like, you can't like the fascist. Like this is, bu- if you are attracted to him, there's something wrong with you. I'm like, there's something wrong with me. <laughs> yeah, I'll have to watch it. No, I'm really, yeah. yeah. It was, it was odd. <laughs> I saw the trailers. It looked good. I mean, I like how Lucy is so different from Katniss, just from the trailers. Yeah, I read somewhere that, like, Katniss was a hunter made to perform, but Mm -hmm. Lucy is, like, a performer made to hunt. She's a natural-born performer. She doesn't do Mm. much hunting, honestly. But, yeah, no, it was entertaining. It was also just, like, it's so long. And we went in it. it. It's like over two hours. I think it's like two <gasps> really? and a half. We went in at like eight forty, and we're like, "Oh, it'll pro- we'll get out before like 10. Yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> we were at like midnight. I don't know why. <laughs> That's a long movie. It was wow. really long, and it felt longer because the pacing issues. That was the problem. Mm-hmm. I kind of really, I think it could have been two movies for sure. Mm-hmm. But I feel like it was a good intermission for those long yeah. movies. Yeah, honestly, because I would need to pee for sure. <laughs> Yeah. God. I didn't pee during that movie. <laughs> I just was no, in I... there like in a daze, like death gripping my seat handles, being like, oh President Snow is yeah. I can't be attracted to him. <laughs> God, I'm so problematic with my taste in fictional men. It's it's terrible. Fictional men who are problematic I feel like are controversial. Like for some reason, at least the circles of Twitter that I was on for a little while, they would take it as like a personal moral failing if you were into like oh, really? Kylo Ren or whatever, who Darth Vader, Anakin. Anakin's so <laughs> fine. Like you can't look at me, look me in the eyes and tell me that Hayden Christensen is not like yeah, the prettiest he's, boy. Yeah, he was very good looking. Like Yeah, <laughs> I mean, he does war crimes and he kills children. That's not okay. I'm not condoning mm, that, but he's so yeah. pretty. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The I hair... Mean, I, I don't really agree that if you like a fictional character that says something about you personally, I Not don't, at all. totally don't believe that, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, but yeah, it, I obviously don't condone that train of thought, but that was like a big thing on some parts of Twitter for a while for some reason. Yeah, yeah. And I can, I'm, I can it's just, that. but like, that's, like, that's just what I like and 
fictional men. Yeah. Emphasis on the fictional, fictional part. <laughs> fictional men who are not actually killing real children or committing real war crimes. And I mm. would hate that person in real life, obviously. Yes, um, yes. But in fiction, it's like fun to follow the villain. It's not it's totally yeah. fun. I think that's fun. Yeah. Okay, I mean, low-key, I love love triangles, but I would mm. never want to be in a love yeah, triangle. Yeah, <laughs> you like to read about it, and, like, it, it brings the drama. That's why I like yeah. these, like, yeah. terrible men. They bring the drama. Like, it's yeah. so it's so entertaining. Yeah, um, it's not real, yeah. anyway. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, what other, like, problematic tropes do you want? <laughs> Tea. <laughs> Let's find out. Honestly, I don't know, but I do love love triangles. Like, I they get so much hate. They really mm-hmm. get so much hate. But I the like angst, them. the angst yeah, the so angst. Fun. It's and like, I... oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, it's actually ridiculous because like, if this was in real life, how would you just not have some boundaries or say like, I'm not doing this anymore? Mm-hmm. Like, how can the love triangle go on for so long in real life? <laughs> <laughs> it is ridiculous. I, I think know. the problem with love triangles for me is when they're just not written well. I feel like it's oh just, yeah, yeah, you're going in circles. Yeah. yeah, or like if that's author anything. has a bias. Yeah, and it's like, okay, clearly this other kid doesn't yeah. stand a chance. That's what yeah. that's what humors me about like the original Hunger Games trilogy is like Gail is mm. not a contender. Like, sorry, yeah. it's always Peta. But I don't clock that as a love triangle. Like it was marketed that way, but it doesn't read that way at all. So I just never think mm-hmm. of it that way. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I agree. And sometimes I don't have any person... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh no, no, no. I was just thinking about Jacob falling in love with Bella's baby. Yeah, that's actually a bit messed up. Like, no, why she is crazy? She's so why hated did she do Jacob that for being brown, which is the way she wrote him. Yeah, yeah. It's um, I mean, it's some um, it's weird. I won't comment on um the author's beliefs as a person, but they definitely seem to shine through there. Mm-hmm. Which sucks because I another problematic fave because he does some dumb shit but honestly i'm like that's not jacob that's stephanie meyer's writing <laughs> they're different entities i love jacob yeah. i am yeah. a jacob black stan and that's just Aww. that's that's the tea that's it okay it, one of his quotes like really rang oh. out to me the other day i don't know why it was the... <laughs> i can feel it i know it was it was like life sucks and then you die oh, <laughs> yeah i should be so lucky <laughs> i don't He's know like what 15 came... yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah i don't know why like i literally just randomly thought of that line um i thought you were I... gonna say bella where have you been loca <laughs> oh. which is my favorite i think my favorite quote of all time i don't even know if it's in the book but that's just mm, like such I'm an sure. iconic it's an yeah. iconic line it's he's a king for that i just yeah. love it bella where i mean been loca? i like taylor lautner as jacob i remember i, I like him did. more in the movies yeah, yeah 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 i think so too i think just like new moon was like a fun movie for me because it's weird i love robert pattinson edward cullen freaks me out i don't like to look at him i think just because he's yeah. kind of like that like dead eyed stare i know and i was yeah <laughs> and Wait, I don't like Bella's age. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. oh i like the movies i definitely don't like the books the okay, movies are just yeah. so much they're so camp and you just like watch them with your friends and get like a little i don't know get your little snacks or your little wine mm-hmm. spritzers and it's such a good time no i was I a love huge twilight, twilight like fangirl i think mm-hmm. i read it when i was really young i was like 14 mm-hmm. um so i did really like edward but i think it's because i was 14 and i like, didn't know better if i read it out i'm pretty sure like that's the there thing. are a lot of yeah as an yeah. adult i'm like these are my students age like i can't <laughs> do this um uh, yeah it's definitely weird reading young adult or like consuming young adult media as yeah. an adult and also one who works with teenagers i'm like there's no way but twilight is just so funny and it's such like a chaotic yeah product of its time um God, I was going to say something else. But yeah, it kind of like went really insane toward the end. But I think that's when it's also fun because it starts out relatively normal with the first one. And then by the end, it's mm. like, Jacob is in love with a baby. <laughs> yeah. And the fact that she like had to turn into a vampire or so her baby would kill her. Yeah. In the womb. That was, it's so graphic too. <laughs> the way they do it in the film. Oh my God. It's horrifying. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's wild. 
Um, what a wild franchise. I think they're remaking I it. They're doing like a remake. Or no. maybe that was a rumor. I love I it. I heard some rumor. I saw someone was like, who would you cast now? Oh, no, someone did say that, like, Catherine, the director. Oh, Catherine Hardwick said that Jacob yeah, yeah. Elordi and uh, yeah. Jenna Ortega. That is yeah. so funny. That feels like a Tim Burton-ass casting oh to me. I know. <laughs> I, I envisioned, envisioned Edward as, like, super good-looking. Mm-hmm. And I do like Robert Pattinson, too. But I did not like their depiction of Edward at all. Mm-hmm. Like, he was just... He just like, like way too pale. Like oh, oh my god, he's so white. That's the whitest I've ever seen a person. Yeah, no, he was definitely like an interesting choice. I think he is. I mean, like he's such a good actor. He's insanely talented. I think mm-hmm. Kristen Stewart is like the most Bella a person could be. Mm-hmm. That is that is Bella Swan for better or for worse. Do you think they would let? Do you think Stephanie Meyer, with the amount of creative control she has, would allow the remake to have like queer characters or other characters of color? Because I think Catherine Hardwick tried to make some of the Cullens, like, POC when she was uh-huh. doing the first one. She wanted, like, oh, really? Alice to be Asian. Somewhat, I don't know. She was like, I wanted the Cullens to be diverse, basically. And Stephanie Meyer was like, no. <laughs> but do you think she would let them do it now? Like, has she grown and changed as a person? I have no idea. Like, <laughs> oh, my God. I, I feel like, okay, I would actually want to know, like, in in forks maybe there aren't as many in forks but i don't know this is Washington's i think pretty white yeah so i can yeah i mean I, I really don't know like how much i mean she's making so much money off of these movies already and she already yeah. had her original like her original movies so like yeah. how much more yeah i think it's I don't just know. like it's insane to me that she used like a real like quilio tribe um and they're their name and their stories and then also had them be people who turn into animals which is so unhinged if you consider the correlation that people have made historically in a derogatory sense with people of color specifically indigenous folks and animals um and then like they didn't see a penny of that that's That's really (laughs) bad and i hope that someone has like I hope that that's been brought to her attention because if they are going to remake it, that's like one thing that I'd really want to see addressed in yeah. some way or just like. I mean, I hope they right. don't remake it. I yeah, think I think it. it'd be funny if they remade it, and I think they will because we're in like the era of remakes. Like, I just don't think there's any stopping Hollywood when it gets a whim like that. Yeah. Yeah, but <laughs> anyway. Yeah, okay, so we've covered almost everything. My last one is, like, young adult versus adult science fiction. Because there is more adult Mm -hmm. science fiction that feels more... And this is on me. Like, I haven't read that much adult science fiction, like the new releases, and I really want to get into that this year. But, yeah, how do you think young adult science fiction would come about versus, like, adult science fiction? Or how do you... Would you notice any differences? Or I actually, like, haven't seen a lot of young adult science fiction um actually in a while um the okay so yeah. everyone hates jay Kristoff. i understand um he has written some mm. questionable books but the one series that i think mm-hmm. should have been like his probably only focus because i think it was very strong um what is it called because i don't even know what it's called but <laughs> it was a science fiction book it, it has like yeah uh, mechs it's almost like cyberpunk there was a bit of like androids i thought that was really strong and that was probably the last real ya fantasy uh, sorry sci-fi book i read um and he also had another one with amy kaufman oh, okay i don't know this yeah the yeah. Illuminate. yes yeah and then amy, he also yeah. wrote they also co-wrote another book um aurora rising so i feel like Mm -hmm. yeah so i feel like he's very good in that like ya sci-fi space but i haven't seen anyone else break into it um yeah yeah what were some of the like like were they all sort of a similar type of Mm -hmm. sci-fi or what was he tackling like technology or space exploration yeah i a lot of no 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 no, go ahead i didn't have a thought yet Oh, I was just going to, just a note, like a lot of science fiction is, it's also like military science fiction. And I think the younger generation doesn't like that. You know what? Fourth Wing popped off and that was military fantasy. But 
I think there's it it puts people off because it's a lot of like empires mm-hmm. and like space mm-hmm. colonization, which is viewed in a very different light. Yeah, yeah. Um, so for his series, I feel like in general he. I feel like it has like a almost a literary tone to it, um, if I can even say that. Um, mm. So the first series I yeah. read was more so about like exploring like the differences between like a robot or a person. I thought it had more more themes on that. Mm. Um, and then the second mm-hmm. series with Amy Kaufman, like the Illuminate, um, it was about. Um, it did have some mentions of a war in some colony, um, but it was mostly about. Uh, a relationship between a girl and wait, I don't know if I should spoil it, but there was there was like a there was like a oh. um, like a ro- relationship that was being built between her and this other thing, and it was not necessarily a romantic one. Mm-hmm. So I thought that was interesting. Um, it was also like in that book on the spaceship, there was some virus spreading, so it was about like survival. Mm-hmm. Um, and then in his other series, the Aurora Rising one. I thought it was also about like the friendships mm-hmm. that were being made. So that one is about this girl who got found in space, and it turns out she was like from a hundred years ago, but like something happened, and they recently brought her to mm. life. That one, I guess, has a bit more like war related, um, but I didn't finish <laughs> that series. Yeah, I was on the second book, but yeah, yeah. So I feel like mm-hmm. that was all the white sci-fi I saw. I read and it definitely had mm-hmm. more of a I don't know I thought it had more of like a, a literary tone than like the really popular books like fourth wing or even the Aquatar series like okay mm-hmm. less on romance I guess that's what I'm trying yeah. to say less on like the romance yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. no that's fair yeah and I think sci-fi tends to do less romance maybe because it is more written mm-hmm. by men mm-hmm. generally speaking just in the broadest general yeah. terms guys and maybe that's another reason it doesn't mm-hmm. like pop off so much in YA is because it does feel a little bit out of place sometimes. In Star Wars, even, they don't do much yeah. romance. They'll do, like, one. And it'll... Because Star Wars has such, like, an epic... And it, Star Wars is science fantasy to me. It has such, like, um, like an operatic mm-hmm. feel. It's, like, these big sweeping romances a lot of the time when they do it mm-hmm. correctly, if they do it at all. Um, I'm mainly thinking of the prequels with that one. They had, like, so much focus on yeah. the Anakin yeah. and Padme romance. Which obviously did not end well. I don't know. I feel like romance and sci-fi have yet to mm-hmm. find a way to really meld in a way that is fully appealing, and maybe that's part of why. Because romance is so big in YA, and like we shouldn't yeah. pretend otherwise. Like there are books that don't have romance that do well in YA, but for the most part, especially now, it's like such a big element of mm-hmm. those books. And there's more space to not do that. <laughs> not pun not intended, but. <laughs> an adult yeah. for sure um as of like the adult sci-fi i read i don't know like i don't think i read i i don't think i can put it into like a few words they're it's just a bit more diverse um but i i have mm-hmm. i am hearing that is hard to sell a sci-fi story so i'm not sure what makes something like sellable or not no that's what's interesting mm-hmm. like what does the market want yeah i have no idea <laughs> sorry where were we um yeah the adult market oh yeah yeah um yeah i mean the murder bot series are really popular right now oh yeah yeah i got my yeah, partner into reading them robots Ooh, really i should check that them. out yeah, yeah they're like novella so they're relatively short although i do think mm. one of the more recent releases was like a novel length oh yeah but they're fun I want to get into the classics first. I really want to read Annihilation and then watch it. Oh, yeah. That was so um, good. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. my gosh. I'm so excited for it. I, like, don't know that much about it. I just have been told I'll really enjoy it. Yeah, I think you'll like yeah, it. Yeah, sci-fi is definitely something I want to branch into. I think, you know, part of the problem is me. In my head, sci-fi is not a light reading experience. Mm-hmm. At least not the books that I want to read. It's not, like, casual and breezy. Like, fantasy, a lot of the times, I can just turn my brain Mm -hmm. off unless it's something really heavy and political, like Baru Cormorant (laughs) or something like that. But, yeah, so I have to, like, prep myself. Yeah, yeah. I can't just, like, consume, which is another thing. There's such, like, an emphasis on consuming books as fast as you can and, like, Mm -hmm. reading as many books as you can, and maybe that's not conducive to science fiction. Yeah. That is super 
hard hitting and impactful. Yeah, actually, um, I was in a reading slump, I think for like two years. This is like way before I started YouTube. Mm. And Annihilation was what brought me out of the reading slump. Oh, no. Nice. Yeah. Wait, that's awesome. Yeah. Okay, great. I will, I'm excited. Yeah, this special place Jeff Vandermeer has mm. in my heart. Yeah. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. I'm not in a full slump right now, but I can't, I've been really struggling to read like full length novels because I only brought my phone. I don't have any physical books and I just hate looking at my phone for that long. Mm -hmm. Oh, I actually had a lot more points, but <laughs> I think we covered most of them. Um, my last thing that I want to close out with is like what, or not last thing, but my last mm -hmm. thing for the topic of the day is do you have any advice for writers looking to branch into science fiction for the first time? Whoa, advice. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, I would say, like, don't be intim intimidated or afraid, but I think it it feels like there's a lot of weight behind it. Um, but I would say, like, don't be afraid and just write it. You can always, like, if you're writing it, you can always revise it and edit it. But I think even before that, I would just encourage you to read more science fiction, um, just more so in mm -hmm. terms of novels than... Uh, movies because as we mentioned like it doesn't really hasn't been really translating um there are a bunch of novellas that i am really interested in reading um so if you want to start like somewhere short you can go there first uh stella form press publishes a lot of sci-fi novellas um they're like a mm. canadian like focus on climate cl climate fiction and oh nice yeah. yeah and then um I'm blanking. Neon, Neon Hemlock is another press um, that publishes mm. more so speculative around, you know, the sci-fi fantasy, but they do have a bit of sci-fi in it as well. And mm -hmm. I just remember something now, which might seem like a plug, but it's not supposed to be a plug. But um, Shoreline of Affinity, they ha they just released a climate change issue. I, I do have a story in it, but mm -hmm. <laughs> if you're looking to read like shorter stories, that's not like a novella. I would go go for that one. There's a there's a ton of great stories and poems in there, like the water bear tardigrade one we yes. talked about. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I need to get that. I need to get my hands on that right away. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great advice. Yeah. Definitely reading is mm -hmm. reading within your genre and reading current things within your genre is like always yeah. my advice for if you want to branch into something new. Okay. So normally we do a sprint segment here, but we're running out of time. So we're going to do the Dear Lynn Agony Ant segment, if you Ooh, want. So fun. Do you want to do like three? Yeah, maybe? let's just do a few. I feel like we'll talk a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. But we love it. And I honestly love these like long form ones. Okay. So we have, I got like 27 during my first call and um, I'm just slowly working my way through them. But so we have technically number 16. This is from Kiana. Um, when writing multiple POVs, it can be hard or a form of whiplash when changing between emotions that the different characters are feeling in the moment. So I think just like maintaining an emotion th between different points of view, basically. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I feel like when I write multiple points of view, my characters are kind of like in line with each other, not in not in what they're actually doing, like their physical activity, but in the place they're at in their arc. Like their highs and lows kind of mm -hmm. correspond. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if I've run into this issue. Any thoughts? Yeah, I haven't like seriously wrote any multiple POVs, um, but I would say that make sure you understand like where they are in their emotional arcs. Um, yeah. I just think in general, uh, not even with multiple POV, even a single POV, um, making sure that the character is aligned to themselves. I, I, I see, mm. I have seen manuscripts where um, the characters don't really know what they're feeling. And I think it's because the author is also struggling with that. So maybe just focusing mm. and um, really aligning like their arcs to how they're feeling in the moment. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just um, I don't think there needs to necessarily be consistency. I think sometimes even like that emotional jarring effect mm -hmm. can work in your favor too. Mm -hmm. can like bring the reader back into it, be like, oh, what's going on now? Um, but yeah, just making sure that you're, it makes sense with what your character's going through and yeah. where your character's at yeah. in their journey yeah. is going to be more important than like emotional whiplash mm -hmm. or consistency 
And also, like, you don't have to write multiple points of view. I thought Moths was going to be multiple points of view for a while, and then I realized it just didn't have to be. So I don't think a lot of stories need that necessarily. It is a tool, it's fun, but sometimes I read some book with like six points of view and I'm like, mm, this is not necessary. So there's also something to mm -hmm. consider. Yeah. I don't know, I'm a hater though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have like one project that I would like to be multiple POV, but that I can't write it now. Like I'm not good enough to write mm -hmm. it now. Like it's really hard, like, yeah, I don't know. It's a skill set. Yeah, and I, I do agree with, like, what you said, how they sometimes, like, parallel each other, and, like, their mm -hmm. highs are almost, or you can contrast, like, a high with a low, so there's yeah. a lot of, like, balance, yeah, it's, it's not easy, but if that's the vision for your book, yeah, I would just say, keep going at it, and, yeah, yeah, good mm -hmm. luck. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> good luck. <laughs> Godspeed. <laughs> All right, let's do number 17. This one is from Marco. Mm -hmm. I go through phases between editing and creating, but how do I know when I should stop tampering with a novel and move on to a new idea? Perennial age old question. Um, you're done when you say you're done, but maybe you have more insight no, than I that, think Kelly. You, you have a better, yeah. I mean, I've, I've actually never taken a novel novel to like query ready, um, but mm -hmm. for short fiction at least, um, you kind of, you kind of get a gut feeling that you know the more changes you make you're not actually improving the story or improving the craft yeah. um mm -hmm. you're just like making things different uh so for me yeah i guess it's more like i have a gut feeling and i've had several people read it and there's not like the vision is where i want it to be so for me it's, mm -hmm. i guess i guess it's more intuitive mm -hmm. yeah that's another good point is like when other people read it and they're saying what you not what you want to hear, but they're saying like, okay, yeah, this works. The elements that I was worried about work. Yeah, um, the things that I set out to fix in my initial revision are fixed for the most part. Like, you're, there really is so much, only so much you can do on your own, which mm -hmm. is again like taking it as far as you can take it on your mm -hmm. own that we talked about earlier. But yeah, yeah. So get other people to read it, see what they have to say. Obviously, some people are not gonna quite align with what you personally feel and think, but listen to your gut as mm -hmm. well. That's a hard thing to, it's such like abstract advice that I don't like giving it, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's really all you can do is you're done when you say you're done. Yeah. Otherwise you're going to be working on it forever and then you'll be like me. <laughs> <laughs> be stuck in a rut. Okay, last one, number 18 from the pile. This one is from Shannon. Hi Lynn, I'm fairly new to writing and recently decided to write my first novel, and I have what I think is an interesting premise and I want to get started, but I don't know how. I've just been focusing on building character sheets, but actually getting words on the page is intimidating. How do you really get started? Character sheets is a good start. Um, my question for this person would be like, have you written like anything before, like short fiction, or have you written fiction before? Um, if not, then maybe it would be a little bit easier to start with a short piece so you kind of get a feel for it and just really start mm -hmm. getting into the process of actually writing. Yeah. Yeah, I was. I had that question too. Um, I would also be kind of curious what books you're reading now too. Um, mm -hmm. I think when I first started, and I think this is normal for a lot of people, like you tend to copy your favorite author or you tend to copy their voice. Um, yeah. So especially if this is like your first like ever written work, um, as after you get through the character profiles, which I think is a good starting point, yeah, I would maybe try to copy like a voice with the first chapter and just see just see how that feels for you. Um, and then maybe rewrite it or like turn to short fiction. Yeah, that's really good advice. Um, yeah, basically the other thing is just like, turn off that little voice in your head and just start to write because there's not much else you can do. And even if it's like not as good as you want it to be, you will improve over time, but yeah. you just have to like keep writing. Yeah. Um, and character sheets is an interesting place to start. I feel like I'd rather start with like a rough outline or just a summary of how you want the story to go. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, those are today's woes. Thank you so much for submitting. After I get through the next like eight in the next couple podcasts, I'm going to open up the form again for people to submit woes again, so don't worry. And that is our last thing. We are wrapped after 
so long. I'm so sorry for holding you hostage, okay. Kelly, really after fine. being late. <laughs> yeah, but thank you so much for hanging out with me today. And do you have any plugs that you want to put in? I can also put links in the description box. Anything you want to promote? Yeah, no, nothing much. Yeah, you can follow me on YouTube. I'm sure all the links will be in the description below. Yeah, thanks, Lynn, so much for having me. It, it flew by. Like, I don't even know how long that was, but <laughs> so much. A lot of fun. Oh, my God. Yeah, I don't want you to edit any more than you have to, so. <laughs> It'll be oh fine. God. It'll be easy. Okay. All right, great. Yeah, I'll put <laughs> links to Kelly's stuff in the description box. And then, yeah, that's it. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you guys in a couple weeks for the next episode, which will be just me. And honestly, if you want a guest, then shoot me a message. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much and bye. Bye.